Well, good morning, everyone. Um, here we are in week two already in the session. Uh, this is the, the Alaska House Majority Coalition uh, press availability number two. We're very pleased to uh, uh, present here today to my right, the Majority Leader Tuck. We're also joined by the House Resources Co. Uh, Chairman, uh, Representative Tarr and Representative Josephson. And just some opening comments to get things rolling. Um, we spent the, the first the initial week, and as we get in the second week, uh, getting our committees into uh, motion, beginning the hard job of putting uh, a budget together and uh, uh, an eye towards the overall fiscal plan. I'm really pleased that, um, that as we uh, begin to have our committees um, begin their work, that we're focusing on measures such as uh, opening up ANWR the Arctic Policy and Economic Development Trade Committee will be meeting at 11.30 this morning, um, and we'll be um, considering Representative Westlake's House Joint Resolution 5, asking Congress to open up ANWR to oil and gas uh, exploration and development. And I sit on that committee, and I'm very much looking forward to that hearing. Um, I would also like to point out that the Resources Committee, and I'll leave it to uh, the co-chairs to provide more details, will be taking up uh, my resolution to encourage uh, Congress and the new administration to uh, take uh, decisive action on the Eisenbeck Road, the road that would link uh, King Cove and Cold Bay, and a road that um, has been uh, the top priority of, um, of the adjoining communities. So with that, uh, Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, you, uh, you've already witnessed that the hard work of crafting the budgets already began. We have uh, a new process in place where we are um, combining the uh, uh, budget subcommittees with the main committees on the subjects that we're going to be looking into. Um, that was kicked off in resources uh, just yesterday. Uh, we have a, a system now that uh, will be more transparent, that will be uh, more efficient, easier to follow, and have more involvement. And uh, and we're proud that uh, we're, we're going to be um, going in that direction. Uh, as we go through this session, we're going to continue looking for new innovative ways of, uh, of including the, pro the public in our process and uh, making sure that um, uh, we are efficient and we're able to focus in on the things that we need to focus on. Representative Tarr. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, Representative Garen Tarr from Anchorage. Proud to represent the most diverse neighborhood in the United States, like to always mention that. And also very honored to be serving as the co-chair of the House Resources Committee this year, along with Representative Josephson. We began our work. Um, we were the first committee to have the budget subcommittee. And um, you know, always good to think about those issues, how important that department is for Alaska. We began our work this week with uh, getting our statutorily required report on the AKLNG project. We heard from our previous partner, uh, you know, the producer parties yesterday, as well as from the state, um, from AGDC, to talk about project uh, progress on that project. It was encouraging to hear that a cooperation agreement is being worked on with uh, BP and uh, AGDC to continue moving forward in a, a much tighter way and just um, restricting the next year's work to a few key items related to continuing our regulatory work and staying on track with that, um, related to really getting the details of the commercial financing agreements and um, figuring out um, you know, so, sort of the final, final details of um, how that project might go go forward so that they could move into the next phase. Um, was also encouraged to hear that ConocoPhillips um, has continued working with the state on, on parts of um, the project going forward and ExxonMobil said, you know, they're looking to restart negotiations on the key commercial agreements. So um, I've been, um, you know, a, a bit of a critic about whether this um, project should continue, whether we can afford um, the project going forward. And I'm still um, looking through that sort of skeptical eye, um, but was encouraged by the report to hear, um, hear, hear some of the developments and, um, and very much looking forward. Uh, if you'll recall, through Senate Bill 138, we're required to get an update every four months. So that next update, I'm very hopeful that we'll have more details about um, some of the financing arrangements. Um, coincidentally, um, Mr. Meyer was overseas actually working on uh, marketing for uh, the gas for this project. So um, looking forward to that next update. Next week, um, we are gonna begin our work on oil and gas tax legislation. We're gonna start out with what we're calling a progress report on Senate Bill 21. 
and we'll spend next week, um, meet, the ne meetings next week, um, hearing from the department. Uh, we have a lot of new members. I'm actually the most senior member on the committee with four years going into my fifth year. So we wanna make sure we lay a good foundation for the work we're gonna complete this year. It'll include a report from the department so we get a good handle on what our obligations are currently and who um, those obligations are to and, and the relative impacts, whether it's on a smaller uh, independent that we're you know, trying to encourage to come to the state and they're waiting for those reimbursable um, cash credits or whether it's in the form of the net operating loss credits for the bigger uh, folks on the North Slope. So we'll start with that. We'll hear from um, the companies, get their reports, and then we'll also hear from some critics of Senate Bill 21. So I think that's gonna be um, a really important week of, of discussion that will lay very good foundation for us to move forward. And with the announcements from Kalis um, about Smith Bay, with the announcement from ConocoPhillips about uh, the Greater Moose's Tooth, it's our firm belief that what will allow those important development projects to go forward is stability in our oil and gas tax system. And that's our, that's our ultimate goal, is um, to be able to come with, up with a policy that will provide the, the kind of stability for the near term, you know, um, that can allow those projects to be developed and bring jobs, uh, much needed jobs to our state, as well as uh, important revenue. And, and we know that's an important part of our fiscal future. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Representative Josephson. Thank you, Representative Tara. I'm Andy Josephs, and I represent the UMED district uh, in East Anchorage. And um, yes, everything that uh, Representative Tara indicated, of course, uh, is, is accurate. And uh, we are going to have a very busy schedule. You know, last year there were 23 hearings uh, on House Bill 247 and oil and gas tax credits. The, you know, I think, I think it's, it's reasonable to expect in a 90-day session you might get 35 hearings. So we don't know that we can do that again. We don't know that it's, it's necessary. We do think that House Bill 247 uh, was a great first step, um, but we think that there's more that needs to be considered. Uh, and we think that um, there's got to be a sweet spot that can be achieved where there's an iterative pr uh, proposal, uh, an iterative system, um, where DNR, for example, can say, yes, this plan of development has merit uh, and uh, it should be incentivized in some way. So I don't think it's my goal, I don't think it's Representative Tarr's goal necessarily to strip away all the credits, but at the same time, we've seen that they're not sustainable. It's, it's almost by definition not sustainable to run up a $700 million tab uh, when you have the deficits that we have. And it should be remembered that those sorts of credits were created at times when we were bringing in as much as $9 billion in a single uh, fiscal year. So we're not in that position anymore, and we are going to be looking at the tax credits again. And we're going to be looking at some modest adjustments to the actual tax schedules, just as Governor Walker did in the 29th legislature. This Friday, we're also going to begin our, uh, a first slate of regular legislation. Speaker Edgman mentioned uh, the Eisenbeck resolution. Um, I think it's noteworthy that the first actual bill we're going to hear is a minority bill. And that speaks to our belief that if a bill has merit, it should be heard. Uh, and you'll continue to see that, I think, from, from most of the committees, if not all the committees in the majority. But the Resources Committee is going to first hear a minority bill. It's the Jonesville Public Use Area Bill, sponsored by uh, Mr. Rauscher, Representative Rauscher. Um, and uh, we'll, you know, we're going to do our best to move through the calendar and accomplish as much as we can uh, this session. Thank you. Questions? Please identify yourself. And please identify yourself as... Uh, Mike hands the microphone. Good morning, uh, Nat Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. Um, I was curious, um, you guys talked last week about how you were gonna preserve your like open caucus meetings before floor. Um, there was a lot of uh, discussion and maybe rumor over the weekend that uh, you guys were also having uh, like a closed caucus and I'm just curious sort of, is that something you guys still in, intend to do and if so, can you just sort of describe what what's, uh, sort of the material that's in the closed caucus versus in an open caucus. If I may. Yeah, that's a, a tradition that uh, has been going on with the previous minority, and we're going to carry that tradition going forward with the new majority, and that is to have open meeting caucuses prior to going onto the floor. An opportunity to discuss uh, what is on the floor that day, if there's any issues, 
uh, be able to get informed on the bills that are going to be there and also to know what's going on in the building um, for the week and, and for that day and, uh, and anything that, that people need to pass on to one another. Uh, as far as uh, when we will be having closed caucus meetings, those are going to be um, at a minimum, but just like the minority, uh, we had closed caucus meetings as well when we had to deal with strategy, and, and that's the primary focus of any type of closed caucus meeting. Can I, can I add one point on that? Sure. Um, you know, recently I've taken the opportunity to look at uh, Title 24, and there is in the law um, a principle that a closed caucus is a perfectly lawful thing, as long as there's not vote counting, and it's, and it's sort of narrowed to a discussion of political strategy. And there's actually a definition that has all sorts of uh, components to it of what that means. So um, I think that people should understand that there's nothing um, atypical or unusual about a closed caucus. I think one, th one thing to add to that as well is that uh, every caucus in the building at some point or another has uh, uh, these strategy sessions where it's just more fruitful to have a discussion where you don't have, uh, 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 you know, the public being involved and you don't have uh, uh, sort of an open environment where people aren't free to, you know, to speak their mind. And, you know, when you look at what happens during a legislative session, it really is a negotiation process, right? So in order to negotiate, uh, Obviously, we have a very open, a very transparent public process that's uh, the, sort of the co cornerstone of doing anything uh, during a legislative session. But you also have uh, these very uh, limited strategy sessions that uh, every caucus uh, takes advantage of in the building. Becky Bohr with the Associated Press. I have a question for each of the co-chairs. Um, first, for Representative Tarr, you mentioned the progress report on SB 21. Um, for yourself, do you have ideas right now about areas that you have concerns with, um, things that you think should be tweaked um, just off the bat before you hear that progress report? And then for Representative Josephson on um, the tax credit issue, one thing that came up in Senate Labor and Commerce from Dr. Townsend last week was the need to get certainty and resolve this backlog of credits that we have. Um, and I'm interested if you have any ideas for how the state could um, resolve that issue. Thank you, Becky. On the um, first part for me, we have the components that we considered last year in House Bill 247, spent quite a bit of time talking about the minimum tax and making sure there was a real floor. We looked at the GVR, um, the gross value reduction that would apply to new oil and, and how long that would be defined in that way. Uh, there was consideration of the per barrel credit and people, you know, wondering if that needed to be tightened up, maybe not such a broad range in terms of the dollar amount. So when you look at those things and, and then look at the credits, those are the basic components of Senate Bill 21. And so if you're going to consider everything, I think that's the reason we want to start with having this progress report and, and look at it a little bit more deeply and, and want to have a consideration of what is the best opportunity. Do we want to be involved at a state level in incentivizing you know, the early exploration work? And that's how you know, we really want to make sure that we, we know that we have all phases of, of development happening. Um, if that's the case, you know, maybe